Welcome to Origin Stories. I'm RD. I'm Parrot. We're telling stories behind the digital art revolution. Each week we interview top artists and live stream with the community. Let's go. Today is tomorrow's Origin Story. Story. Bill Ellis, welcome to Origin Stories. Hello, good evening, good morning. You were here as part of a live stream. And I think yeah. one of the first things we said as part of it and then after it was we needed the official origin story. And he here we are getting it done. Yeah. No, it's been a long time coming. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm a pleasure to be here. We have a tradition. Yeah. We, we started the tradition on live stream. Yeah, we started it and now I have to do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Care to share? Yeah. We've got to drink whiskey. So and tonight and probably next week. I've brought a Lagavulin 16 years single cask, single malt from Miley. What have you got? One of my all all time favorites. You were holding. Um, I actually had had a bottle of that. It is no longer yeah. with us, and so uh, pour one out for that bottle. Yes, and send you one. But I'm going. I'm going whiskey today. Going nice. To Rip Van Winkle, part of the Pappy family. One of Amazing. one of the one of the lesser Pappies. One of the lesser Pappies. I want to get a. a down more soon but we'll see we might get it as a present after next week well it'll be it'll be something worth celebrating cheers, Ellis, anyway. cheers man cheers we made it here comes your origin story and with that also for everyone listening i don't drink all the time <laughs> just, just on podcast right it's not because everyone every time i say something on twitter or discord or stuff everyone just starts throwing whiskey emojis i'm like i don't drink all the time <laughs> is what we have that one live stream and then on my second drop and now tonight and next there, week and, uh, yeah <laughs> there are a lot of whiskey glasses being thrown around when it comes to bill ellis on twitter yeah yeah it would become skulls and whiskey glasses yeah, there's nothing wrong with that bill ellis what is your origin story oh how do we start you can take take us as far back as you okay. want to go what means far something back. to you today Far back, I mean, so I grew up in Greece. Dad's Greek, mum's English. Um, I was always kind of creative in a not so obvious way. My dad played music, played the sousaphone, got me into the clarinet, so I played clarinet for 12 years. Got me into a band, and then I suddenly got in with the, the bad boys of school when I was around 14, 15. They weren't even bad boys. They were considered bad boys because they were skaters and graffiti boys. And that ignited a huge interest in naughty art. Like it was fun to be kind of bad by graffiti because it was all illegal back then. And that was the first sort of experience of the community of people that like to draw and then just connect and have fun with it. And I think that was, that, was, that was the beginning. And then I just kept on just have drawing for the fun of it. I never thought it would ever be a career or anything. And then I set my mind on coming to the UK and studying here. My first course, I got into university and it was multimedia production and technology. So it was all about like um, coding and motherboards and technical stuff and sine waves and all that shit nothing arty at all and like c plus and all that stuff and then i mean, it was six months in the course i'm like i'm useless to this like awful and then there was another course called digital art and technology which was a bit more arty in the sense that you learned the theory of art and fear of abstraction and then putting concept to abstraction and all that stuff and then i just swapped to that but even that course was just art through code Mm -hmm. people like Refik and Pack would have loved it but it wasn't for me and then I remember there was one tutor a lovely guy called Vlad from Russia he was 58 and he came in one day and he showed us one video of Blender 3D and then I just started playing around with that stupid monkey you get in Blender and then through that started doing trap code stuff after effects generative sort of visuals audio reactive stuff did some 360 dome stuff and then i found cinema started playing around with that my work at the time was very vibrant i was looking up to people like justin muller rick oystenbrook uh 
Nicholas Lundberg, all the boys from uh, Depth Core. And I haven't tried to, I applied to get in there and Justin said no. But it Ooh. wasn't just Justin. I, I used that as a joke, but this was like over Justin, 10 years. Justin, come on, man. But I turned that all the time, but it was a whole process. It was the beginning of art communities. It was amazing because there was all these forums and you would apply with your work and then the members would vote. And if you get accepted, then you're in the cool crew. And then you, you, we had exhibitions every three months and then you get feedback, people will collaborate. This was like over 10 years ago. This is where I met Boss Logic. Uh, loads of these people, we all met in the same space. And loads of people coming up now, like um, Jericho, mm -hmm. he's killing your own foundation and loads of other people that are now seem to be coming up in the space. I've been doing this from way back in 2008 and stuff. So that was the first taste of like internet art and the sense of community and popularity and showing your stuff off and everything. And at that time, my work was a mashup of 3D typography, Photoshop, everything. Um, I wasn't sure what I was doing. And I was lucky enough to work with Formula One and Team Red Bull in a job. And then at that age, I was like 21 or 22. Crazy money, well, crazy money seemed then. But then at that age, I spent it all. Did the project, great project. But then I was like, all right, this is it. The dream is real now. Yeah. We're going to get crazy clients every month. It's going to be nonstop. Well, none of that happened. So then the year ended and then I had none of the money left. A crazy tax bill, loads of debt. Uh, so I started working bars and nightclubs again while trying to figure myself out. And that's when I did one of my first projects in the, the style that I'm known for now. And it was 50 individual human skulls. Mm -hmm. with a variety of decorative patterns throughout the history of humanity and races, ages, cultures, religions, everything in one. And that kind of went viral. And that, but I, know, I still never thought that that would be my career. I was working in ad agencies, doing commercials and animation, art directing for animation. And that was always my sort of side hustle, like the dark art, because I was just brainwashed thinking that Nah, 3D and digital art is for advertising and motion graphics. It, it cannot be art as people consider it. So hold that thought for a second. The 50 skulls, wh why do you go there? Had you had a, a fascination with skulls prior? Was this a new, a new thought, a new experiment that then became something more? Since I was 14, 15, well, in school, I remember uh, my art teacher called my parents and suggested they get me a psychiatrist because I was I was just drawing weird shit like zombie spider-man Jesus and just mashing things like comics and religion and growing up in Greece religion is everywhere because they're orthodox so orthodox religion uh, Christian art is amazing it's the same similar in Russia and stuff is heavily decorated uh, decorated and adorned and ornamentals all over and golds and and I'd, the artwork is amazing. And then obviously Greece statues everywhere. It, it's almost like it's sort of brainwashing because there's just so much everywhere. And people come there to see it because it's amazing heritage, but growing up in it, it's just normal. Mm -hmm. So you just see it everywhere. And then, because I didn't grow up in a big city, so it was a bit run down. So there was graffiti everywhere. So it was mashing up everything. And then I liked video games and comics. So it's just this big mess of stuff that inspired me. And then that's the thing with inspiration. It takes time mm -hmm. to filter through what you really like. And as you grow older, then you start to find out what is that really inspires you not. But yeah, I've, the, the, the skulls and the, and then music as well, metal, listening to metal since I was 14. It's all those cultural influences all blend together into a body of work. And, but and deeper so down, yeah, the real reason why my work has this sense of undertones of death and stuff is because I illustrate my worst fears. So fears of loneliness, fears of losing loved ones, the fear of death mm -hmm. is what makes me trying to beautify death in order to cope with my own fears and insecurities. Interesting. Now, where is that? Where does that thought come in? Right. Cause that's a profound thought. That's a, that's a, a very connected thought yeah. to, to what's going on under the surface. Now, 
Does that come in along the road somewhere when you're doing some introspection? Is this something that you were aware of from the very beginning? No, I wasn't aware. And it, it became apparent to me when I did the seven, the, the why test. Do you know the why test? Hmm. Someone just asks you why. Okay. And you say your first level answer. And then they ask again, ah, yes. why? And why? And why? And the, the deeper you get to it, you find the true cause of the problem, the issue, the inspiration, everything. Things that your mind blocks away that you don't want to talk about because it's too vulnerable. You will hide underneath superficial responses like, yeah, because skulls are cool and shit. Mm -hmm. But that's not the real level there is you've got to dig, dig deeper down mm -hmm. and then you'll find the real answer. And it is, is fear of death and losing loved ones and the fear of darkness. And well, because darkness evil in religion i might not be religious now but the fear of the supernatural the occult still lives there mm -hmm. and the fear of death is always there so it's a coping mechanism hmm. so interesting before so before you knew right before you knew the, yeah. the answer to the ultimate why test why the 50 why the 50 what did they represent it started off as a as a test uh it was just messing around because it wasn't even the culture, of, the cultural state of these skulls. It was literally playing around in 3D. But I didn't feel comfortable showing it because there was no, what's the story? Mm. It's, that's the thing is with art, there needs to be a story. Otherwise, it's just graphics. Mm -hmm. So I just, I did some research and then I found out about the Kutna horror in Europe and the catacombs and just every civilization has an obsession with skulls. We've got the decorated saints in, in Catholics. We've got, there's so many uses of skulls. We've got the um, sugar skulls in Mexico. We've got so many things like humans throughout the history. We've got uh, Egypt, every, every country, every civilization at any point in time have had depictions and artistic uses of skulls. So I tried to infuse that almost like a, like a historic encyclopedia of use of patterns through the morbidity of what a skull represents. And when you tie that project up and it becomes the, the 50 skulls and you look back on it, are you thinking, do you, do you come to any epiphany at the end of that project? Do you look These, back? That's, that's the first one I ever made and it's a one of a kind silk screen print with like wow. gloss and gold leaf on it um so i've had that for years so it means an awful lot to this day yeah i think it was the realization of that was that i've got something to say and i've got more to me than just design mm -hmm. that's when I, I started to consider myself a bit more of a illustrator slash artist mm-hmm so, yeah, I wanted to pause there because to me, that's the, I know the term is kicked around a lot these days in the art space and the NFT space, but to me, that's the, the genesis of, of your interaction with skulls. So it fascinates yeah. me to go back to that first project and just pick at that a little bit. And I like that you, you didn't necessarily know why at, at that time, but that then dawned on you later. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of pressure on artists as well to find your style where mm -hmm. your style can come in a week or your style can take five years six years you don't know when it's going to happen and uh, that's the thing is the style constantly evolves because it's as we grow so it does our work so that was the beginning of like infancy of what i do now amazing so carry it forward i i interrupted and no, that's uh, all right. i interrupted there but yeah ca carry us forward so you had mentioned you mentioned the uh, the agency life yeah so while that was happening i was working in an advertising agency and um some very cool stuff work with coca-cola nike uh apple although we can't say we work for apple because apple never tells you never lets you talk about apple um we worked on all that stuff and at the same time i was being i was talking to some fine art galleries uh one in particular i won't mention name but they they deal with banksy and damien hurst and shepherd ferry and all these guys and because this project sorry uh went viral naturally they were interested so we started talking and at this point i thought my life is made i'm going to be a famous artist and i'm going to fly in jets and super yachts and stuff 
which is not how shit works and that stuff's not important <laughs> anyway but i got like rose tinted glasses and i thought everything was amazing and i just went with it and then when i was in it i realized that this is a bit of an extortion they were taking 60 percent i was getting 40 percent. i had to produce everything cover all the costs of making and shipping and then at the end of it i lost money and all this while trying to run a day job and stuff and that was sort of quite a big blow because you have these dreams and then you get a little a little bite on the fishing line and then you get on it but then it's just a cart tire or a boot so you got your hopes up and then it goes to shit and I'm assuming no tie to secondary sales, like no, in no. NFTs. No, no, yeah. Number one edition seller, and there were, I think the the limited editions of that one were selling for a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. So after production cost, commissions, and everything, I was making like twenty dollars a print. Yeah, and we're talking silkscreen prints here, not G clay. We're talking hand pulled prints, so. You so learn. A, a brutal realization in the moment. Yeah. And you, you, and the main problem with that was I wasn't treated the same as all the others. I'm not saying to be treated the same as Damien Hurst because this gallery had many artists and upcoming artists and all sorts. But as I was digital. I remember one day I went in to drop an order and I had 10 prints with me. And the actual owner just looked at me and he goes, who are you? Mm. And I'm like, I'm one of your artists, dickhead. Yeah. At that point, I just walked out and I took the prints with me. And then I asked the producer to take me off the website. And that was the end of that relationship. Wow. Yeah. It was just, it was just soul crushing because you just feel, you know, imposter syndrome. You just feel completely inadequate because Mm -hmm. you're digital. And this was like eight, nine years ago. Mm -hmm. And you just feel completely useless because you're not a real artist because you're digital. And especially art art is so tied to emotion anyway, you know, you're putting yourself on the line, you're putting yourself out there. Yeah. And it helps. It helps when someone else I'm I'm, I'm sure now I don't produce art per se, but I'll have probably I've produced projects in the past where you're you're looking for that opinion. Don't necessarily need it to be validated as a person, but it helps. It helps. It goes a long way. And when the people that are meant to be selling your art don't even know who you are, it's not the best emotional help when you're putting everything out there. But it's all that's the thing is no artist has had it easy at any point in their life and then even the most successful people the the in my opinion the best the most successful people are the ones that have actually struggled because otherwise you don't know what failure is and without failure you don't know how to strive for better so we've all got there and then yeah so i was trying to juggle that and agency life at the same time and just thinking like what well, do i want a career in the advertising world or do I want a career as myself? And you've always got that annoying voice in the head. That's like, yeah, agency life is cool, but you could do this little thing. Like you can make this little thing. And then you're just spending lunch times and evenings doing that little thing, which eventually becomes what we are here today. So that moment though, that you walk out of, you, you walk in, you're not acknowledged. You say, forget this. I'm out of here. Take me off the website. I'm done. Done. Do you use, is that your moment of, of resolution? Do you turn that right back around and say, I'm, I'm going to do this still, but I'm doing it in a different manner or no, do, you, was, do you kind of I take a step to, back and, and I just say, went to work. Yeah. I just went to the studio. I was like, sort of lost interest and stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then I just kept playing around, but it takes a while. It's like, it's a bit of a breakup. You need time to heal mm-hmm. and then you get back on the horse sort of thing. So at that time, it was great for the agency. We did some great work and stuff, but it was still it wasn't my work. It was their work and the client's work. And that's when I started developing more with my own stuff, more of the decorative and religious work. Mm-hmm. And then naturally started getting some commissions in from book uh, covers and stuff in the US. Did one book cover, which eventually became New York Times best-selling book. To then when people open the book, they see my name. So then that one book became 45 book commissions in one year. Mm -hmm. And then it was the same time I got headhunted. Well, I got a fan through Instagram from Nike Basketball. 
to do a project about LeBron James. And then I was reading the email on my computer in the studio. And then the, the managing director walked past and he's like, what's that? It's Nike. I'm like, yeah, they asked me to work for it. And then he goes, well, we worked for Nike once. Therefore, on your contract says that we do it. We'll give you a commission. It was a $65,000 job. And they gave me a commission of $400. And I did the entire campaign completely by myself, including weekends and nights. And they got, I got $400. They got $64.6 thousand dollars. That's, and that's I, for the LeBron James campaign? Yeah. And at this, at this point, I decided, that's when the brain, when I just started thinking like, why the fuck am I doing this? I could have made that money by myself, but I just mm -hmm. gave it to someone just because I'm contractually working for them when it's my work that brought the client in and my work that eventually did their final campaign. So three months after that, or two months after I handed in my notice and then I was gone. Wow. So that's the second FU moment along yeah. the Bill Ellis Road. But the second FU moment was more considered because I had these book clients and I had some nice freelance things on the side that I was saving those funds. Mm -hmm. But for anyone that asks me how to go freelance, I'm like, have enough money to live and pay your bills and stuff for three months minimum. And in those three months, all you have to do is just create and contact. It's a, you will find something and you're at least covered. And then worst case scenario, if you're good at what you were doing before, you can go back to it. Mm -hmm. So I had funds for five months just in case I never needed it because you put your, your whole entire being into what you want to do. You put everything in this dream. It's not going to fail. And for you, it's probably, I mean, you basically said this, but just to reiterate it, it's great that you know you brought that mega client in. They wanted to work with yeah. you. Yes, you gave up the lion's share, almost all of the, the yeah. what the commission was. But you had that probably in the back of your mind to say, like you said, I could do this myself. Yeah. This, this, is, yeah. this is my show. And so you have the funds saved up, you jump ship, and you, you tear after with a load of confidence. Yeah. And this was at a time as well where social media was was big, but nothing like as big as it is now. Mm -hmm. This was like well, six, seven years ago. So Instagram was like a cool portfolio and stuff. But now you get DMs from like big time clients and they actually just DM you and stuff. Right. I prefer an email because I find it more professional, but you do get DMs and stuff. And then you just start creating relationships with all these people. It's just so easy now. It's easy and hard because there's so many people doing it. Mm -hmm. But if you're true to yourself and unique in what you put out there and you work for it, it will happen. And the NFT space is a massive example for it now because artists that have been doing this for so long are now finally being rewarded. And also upcoming artists, the work and the art, or well, not the work, the art shows. Mm -hmm. The real passion just shows. There's a lot of fluff around, which mm -hmm. is natural because it's hype. And a lot of stuff will come around, but when the dust settles, the real diamonds will shine. And those will be the ones that have put hard work into the craft. And it's the same with everything. It's always the case. I think that's, that's key with people, but we live in a time where we don't need to be in an office. We don't need to work for someone. Like even if you work for someone while you're at home, cause you got COVID and stuff like think the idea of going back to an office now, drives me fucking mad i can't seems believe a, people are, yeah it's just it's absurd mm -hmm. like why you people are more productive when they've got the freedom to be by themselves and create mm -hmm. and meetings happen because you got a waste of time you just need to fill time because you just sat there twiddling thumbs and doing fuck all where you could be creating yeah it's true i think the only caveat there is to say you know be social in some manner right be physically yeah. Physic when, when obviously circumstances allow, be physically social in some, in some manner. But if you have that taken care of on your own, then yes, who needs to be in an office? Yeah, I mean, the office has a fun social side, but um, it's, it's more of like quality of life. Like the nine to five system, I, I don't get it. It was created a long time ago and it just makes no sense right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them, I, I 
I work in the morning when I'm vibing because it's peace and quiet because all you guys are sleeping. So it's not like Twitter going mental and discords and stuff. So yeah. I can just create. And then evening is like, I call it, well, I consider it networking. So it's like, that's when people are awake. That's when the good discussions happen and the chats and the showcasing and the ideas and everything. Yeah. So what's your start time in the morning? What's your, what's your process look like when, when the world is quiet? <laughs> When I'm not making stuff, when I'm not, I mean, when I'm not making a collection, I like to wake up around eight, but the past few weeks is that's gone out of the window. This morning I was up at half four or five because my brain was in overdrive and it's so bad that I have to lock the phone away in a complete different room. If I've got my phone in the bedroom, it can be like miles away from me or like on my girlfriend's side in her drawer. I will still randomly wake up pretending I need a piss and I'll just go and open the drawer and check my phone. And it's like 4 a.m. Like, what the fuck are you doing? So I have to hide the phone completely away so the brain can rest a bit because there's a lot of well, stress and FOMO because there's so much speed in what's happening right now. It's just, it feels like everyone's feeling a bit like, if I don't do it, I'm going to miss out. Right. And that, I think that's a... That's a trauma state created by all the years where no one considered us as real artists. And we were always someone else's designer, someone else's member of staff, someone else's commission. We were, uh, and now we've got, our, we, we've got our platform. It's almost like a worry that's going to be taken away from us. Mm -hmm. It's like, here's the juicy, shiny thing. Have a lick and we're taking it. So, so sprint, sprint, sprint to get as many licks in as possible yeah. while, while it's here. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. It's it's very difficult sometimes to give long-term advice because of that, right? Yeah. Because there is no guarantee. There's no certainty, of course. Even even someone who believes in this space as much as I do, I know nothing is 100%. Yeah. Right? Um, so yeah, I really it, it, believe in this space as well because I, I, I want to believe in it because we all deserve it. Mm -hmm. But then again, it's a, my, my own business mantra, do not put everything, all your eggs in one basket. It was not my business mantra, but it's... Is I, I, I love the NFT space and I'm putting most of my being into it now, but I will still do cool client commissions. And I will still do my own prints and my packs and all that stuff because I think it's good to diversify because if one thing goes tits up, we've got something else. And that's something else, not a random plan B. It's a plan B relative to what we love doing. I think that's smart. And to go back to something and to connect two dots, you gave a bit of a playbook to an artist, right? An artist who may be looking to make a move, yeah. maybe looking to change their, their life, their profession to some degree. And you started that playbook with the three months of savings, right? Saving three yeah. months of funds. Minimum three months, but yeah. Yeah, but, but I, I enjoy that. I think that that's very practical. I think that's tangible. I think it needs yeah. to be said. You know, just those simple bits of advice and laying out how might this look if you yeah. decide to pursue, decided to pursue something. Because in worst case scenario, you might not get anything, but at least in those three months, you've put the feelers out and the work and the time mm -hmm. to try to make those connections and trying to find that work. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't find commissions, we live in a time of creators where people create their own money. Mm -hmm. You can literally, like as creators, you can make packs, assets, stocks. You can create calendars, clothes, prints, anything like we create our own money sort of thing is if I was to take away my client commissions, which I've been very good because we've got John Wick, Diablo, mm -hmm. uh, Gears of War, musicians, Apache, all that stuff. If we were to take that away completely, so I had zero client commissions and take completely off the NFT space, I've made the moves to have a salary and live off a year from my other ventures. Like, assets for other creatives and prints and some licensing deals because it's important to have all those in place because we literally create our own money mm -hmm. that's what creators can do now pretty fascinating to think that yeah. an inspired 24 to 48 hours just an on fire 24 to 48 hours can yeah. like tan tangibly bring something into existence that then enters an infrastructure and in the nft space where you can turn that around have that direct connection be made on a place like foundation on a place like if yeah, you're, if you're approved somewhere else. Right. Yeah. How crazy is that? It's crazy. And like, I love rareable as well. Cause we're seeing like, I love seeing collections. I love individual pieces, but what gets me is collections and bigger mm -hmm. projects that have like thoughts in it. Like 
boy, hashtag boy, or yes. stripped him on that my mate Fenton did, which is incredible. Mm-hmm. It's like the eggs and the, the little mons that will be coming and just seeing people like, um, these are not teams. This is one person coming up with his madness and then creating it. And then the world going mental over it. I just love it. It's crazy. A lot of elements go into that too. You know, yeah. the, the, the community and the, the virality of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, I just love that. This, and people come together and help, but it's still like one person powerhouse. Mm-hmm. And I just, I just love it. And I like to spread the love a bit and get some assistance. Like my web experience, I didn't make it. I got my mate David to do my trailers. I got my mate Eric to do sound on my previous job. I got my mate Luke to do because we, we want to do all these things because we are the artists, but there's magic in offloading and collaborating with other people. Yeah. And we've seen it with so many other artists. It's just good to share. It is. And, and can't have strengths everywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, Banksy's not, he's got a whole team. The, Daniel Larsham has got a huge team. So same digital space. It's still the artist's ideas and input, but mm-hmm. an artist, we've had to learn to be our own artist, producer, marketing manager, director, accountant, assistant, PA, cleaner, tech assistant, and everything in one person where no other place works like that. No, no. So, Bill Ellis, keep walking us down the road, right? Back. Uh, Let, let's take us back now where at Agency Life, right, you get reinvigorated. You start pouring yourself into your art again. You, yeah. have, you have some breakthroughs. I've quit the agency by this point. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think this was at a time I was really vibing my stuff, just making my own personal art. And then... I think that was at the time I was doing a lot of book stuff and then some small music stuff. And then that's when I got connected with Apache uh, where he just, what I love about him, he gave me full creative freedom and he's like, just do the thing. Here's the music, do your thing. And we've been working like that ever since. He would just send me a little email. He's like, I've got a new thing coming out. Do you want to make something? I'll just make something. Mm -hmm. Um, did all that stuff and then I had the pleasure of working with Ozzy Osbourne and did some stuff for Ozzy and a magazine cover and some stage stuff so that was amazing and I've got the actual artwork signed by him and that's upstairs in the studios uh, framed because I'm not touching that Uh, so I was doing all these things and then the big break came with John Wick Mm. so John Wick wasn't even John Wick was a campaign to get five, it was a social media campaign to get five artists to do their take on John Wick. Mm -hmm. And then he was just going to live on socials and that was it. And then I told my agent, I'm like, yeah, fuck that. I'm going to do this proper. So then I went away for three months and I didn't show the client anything in three months, Mm -hmm. but I worked on it for three months by myself. I had like 12 versions that I deleted because I wasn't happy with it. Mm-hmm. And then I showed the final version, which was the final in my eyes. We shared it to the client and then they went mad and then they showed it to Lionsgate, to which Lionsgate's executive producer decided it should be the IMAX poster. And then the IMAX poster happened and it was at the premiere. And then uh, the other producer saw it and now it's the Netflix artwork as well. So it, what I wanted to do, I saw it like a pitch and that was my sort of training from being in an agency is like, well, here's your pitch. So you need to win it. Yep. What they pitched to me was a social media campaign. What I saw in my brain, I wanted my artwork in the cinemas. Yep. So I created my own, my own pitch from this job. It was a non-existent pitch, but I wanted it. Yep. So I saw, I created it. And then I saw a picture of Keanu Reeves in the premiere with my artwork behind him. And I'm like, yeah, if I can do that. That's amazing. That, that was the moment in my career. I was like, shit, that's cool. Yeah. And do you have a moment there? Do you connect? Do you reflect on the LeBron James campaign and think, look, look at how far I've come to yeah. now be able to do this all myself, create this moment, receiving all the commission. Yeah. It's just, it's incredible because it's, it's just trusting the artist. The client trusted me. 
And when you trust an artist, they they're their own worst critic. So mm -hmm. if I was to share stuff early on, I wasn't happy with it. They were going to nitpick it. They were going to hate it. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I just spent three months until I was happy with it, it just showed. The only change was literally change the picture of Keanu because we've approved a different photo of him. That was it. They didn't change anything else around it. So the artwork was there. I just had to change the picture of him. Mm -hmm. And then that was one of the most straightforward client jobs I've ever had because they just let me do my thing. Yeah. So there is, there is beauty in client stuff. Like same as Diablo with Blizzard. That was, I never, I never expected in my life to go anywhere near this stuff. Yeah. I expected to do fan art and just yeah. do stuff for fun. I never got expected to be paid and to be respected by such a big powerhouse to do such a respected artwork that Brom had set years ago. And it's like, it's a piece of sort of gaming history. Yeah. And then there was a lot of pressure in it. I've been working, I was working over six months and the pressure was immense, not from Blizzard, but from me. Cause I'm like, well, mm -hmm. I've got, I've got to sort of beat that. Mm -hmm. And if I fuck it up, I'm the one in fault. So there's a balance of stuff because you're dealing with someone else's creation and you're mm -hmm. trying to put your own spin while, put, while paying respect to that creation. And if you're the type of guy too, to go away for three months and sequester yourself to go through 12 iterations of the John Wick yeah. artwork, you're definitely the kind of guy that's going to put a lot of pressure on yourself when it comes yeah. to a big brand. Yeah. Because you just see is like feedback. Feedback is a weird one. Cause I'm very, I'm very bad at taking feedback mm -hmm. and that's not because I'm up myself. Or I think I'm always right. I'm bad at taking feedback because I don't want to, t to get to a stage where I need to take feedback. Mm -hmm. I want what I show to be effortless and for people to see it and be like, that's great. Don't need to change it. And that's like my own worst enemy because that's how I work. And I think that's the sort of safekeeping from crushing expectations by just not sharing my best self in the creation. Well, also, you know, this takes me back to another origin stories with Colin Frangicetto when he talked about yeah. the vulnerability of an idea in early stage, right? Yeah. An idea attached to an artwork. It's very vulnerable. And if you do get the wrong feedback at the wrong time, they could crush it. Right. So it sounds to me like you're going through that wise early process of <laughs> wrapping your wrapping yeah. your arms around that idea yeah. and, and and making sure it it is in a good place when it sees the light of day. Yeah, it's a, it's the same with NFT as well. It's this collection, I had two other ideas, not for this collection, but for my third collection, I completely deleted them. And this collection had thirteen pieces. Mm -hmm. And three, I completely deleted the file because mm. it wasn't good enough. Mm. And I wasn't prepared to put that out there just to hit a number. And how long did you spend on each of those three pieces that you outright deleted? Uh, I think it was over a week. Mm. But I work very fast because I've got my, my techniques and stuff. And my lighting is set because I've got my own templates and stuff that I've made over the years. Mm-hmm. But for, to work on over a week on three pieces and versions again and again and then bin them, I'm like, yeah, it's not working. Mm -hmm. Get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And it happens is just trying to put something good out there and then you've got to cull it. Yeah. Let's continue down Origin Story Road. So you're, you're, you're landing these big brand deals and every, everything is happening for you. Yeah. Connect the dot to where NFT comes into your world. So the client stuff is amazing and money is great. And then I've got my own side hassles and assets and giving back to the community and helping other designers because I like sharing assets and yeah, I make some profit, but also people get great stuff to work with. But then I was like, I was struggling with the idea of having to just, let's say I'm 40 years old. And I've still got create directors giving me feedback. Or oh, I'm 50 years old and giving me create directors giving me feedback. I'm like, well, I don't want to be like that. But I didn't know what the future was. So I was selling prints and stuff. And 
just open editions of prints. Just, mm-hmm. They're not like hand finished, right? They're like nice prints, but it was more of the passive income. And then I first started. I've apologized about this many times before on Clubhouse, but I think it was on Twitter and then started, people started talking, talking to me about crypto art. And I'm like, I was brainwashed by the traditional art world. I'm like, yeah, that's, no, no, I was going to buy that. And I said, no, publicly. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I believe Iaphoria was explaining in the private discord chat what it was. And then I couldn't get it. I'm like, well, what do people do with it? So I was literally being that classic idiot that we get now. I was that person. And because that's because I was brainwashed with the expectation that digital art should be made physical to match the needs of the traditional art world so far. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't see past that because that's all I had my whole life. People telling me digital art is not worthy. So you have to make it physical. Um, So then I had IV Gallery approach me together with nifty and i said nah <laughs> i just said nah it's not interested and then i had super rare and i think I, we had a call but then he went quiet and then iv gallery came back again mm-hmm. the day after people's first drop and i'm like all right let's talk not because of the money but because i saw things moving more and so was there was there pitch was there pitch at that point like Hey, do you get it now? Like, hey, can we? Well, it was it was more like let, let's talk, uh, and it was credit to them. Vincent, as well, was very pushy because mm-hmm. I mean, Vincent brought people into the NFT space and Boss Logic and many others, mm-hmm. and it was a case of like, all right, I'll hear you out. And he's a he's a fellow Brit as well, so we were on the phone, and I think. What was different was Vincent is from an art gallery. So he explained it to me in ways that I knew already because of my experience with art galleries. Because I think it's it's also a bit daunting for people entering the space, not knowing about crypto and the the sort of, not issues, but the, what's the word? The, the rumors around crypto and how, because it is... It has been for for years like a sort of outsider thing Mm -hmm. and all those things. And he came to me with like just a straight discussion. He's like, well, your art is digital. Why the fuck are you making it physical? Be true to the medium of your art, which is digital. And then you can sell it as digital art. And then we talked about actual galleries with uh, physical displays and all these things. And it it just started making sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact as well that nifty was bridging the gap between crypto and fiat because i was like that's what i was struggling with because i had no experience with crypto before the nft space at all i know some people some mates of mine had stuff but i just i had no balance no wallets nothing before the nft space and then yeah i mean i'm glad i went with it i'm glad they pushed me and i'm i was a fucking idiot for not believing in the first place but then, I, don't, I don't think so at all. I think that that's, yeah. I think that's a, I think it's easy in the bubble. Yeah. I don't actually don't want to use that word because I've been yeah. railing. I've been railing against this whole conceptualization of the whole thing as a bubble. I think yeah. that's not nonsense, but um, it's easy within this space. Let's put it that way to yeah. look outside the space and say, Oh, look at that idiot over there who doesn't know how to use a wallet or transact in crypto or doesn't, yeah. or doesn't, or doesn't get it. But I think we're the outlier, and that's slowly changing, right? As more people get it, more people yeah. are uh, are understanding. But yeah, I, I still think there are a lot of people out there who need to hear something exactly like this about how you initially didn't get it, got the explanations you needed, yeah, got it, and then now, I mean, now I'm you're one on a of the different... biggest biggest pushes of the space. I think it's incredible. Exactly, and like just more, the more, and it's as well. Is I was just ignorant and agnostic on the matter because i didn't know Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of that's that's what happens is people fear what they don't know Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of that's why there's a lot of aggro and stuff because people just don't get it and then as i was getting into it i started researching more and then how crypto just makes more sense because in my head why the fuck are we printing copper coins for 
coins that have no value or using paper that someone said it has value mm-hmm. where everything we trade is data everything is digital the the like the fact that i've got art in this house i've got art that i like i i look at it about five percent to comparison of one thousand percent of what i look at my nifties every day i'm there i'm like ah finding new stuff new details and it's just i feel like because we're part of the same community and physical artists and digital artists is it just feels like acceptance has so much more power than just to me a print on the wall that i've just got there because I bought it, but it hasn't got the same feeling. Is my collection is friends of mine that I've supported, artists that have I've haven't had a break in life or they're struggling and they've got amazing artwork, but there's no one to buy it because well, not there's no market for animation. Mm-hmm. If you're an illustrator, you can make a print, but if you're an animator in any three animation or two D animation the only work you can get is by doing commissions for clients. Mm -hmm. So your art will never be your art. It will be a commission. Mm -hmm. So now all these people have this space and they're creating fucking madness. I love it. I'm addicted. I've got over 60 NFT now. And like the more money that comes into me, the more I'm going to buy. Yeah. I have to check with my girlfriend. I'm like, this is what I've got. She's like, how much have you spent this week? I'm like, this amount. It's like, oh, that's fine. I'm like, more, buy more. (laughs) I love that. We're going to get to that Nifty collection because it is one of the more impressive Nifty collections of any artist that's ever been on Origin Stories and for that matter, any artist that I know. And I'm not Um, a way or or a big collector or anything. I'm just like, I like it. It's cool and it's fun. Your collection is nuanced. It has depth to it. You're on multiple platforms, which is interesting because not every artist is. A lot of artists who have collections is on one platform and that's fine yeah is on one platform but i was impressed I even pre-recording i did not know you were on another platform and you had quite yeah. an impressive collection we'll get there but i want to go back real quick the entry into nifty right so you have the conversation with vincent you get it yeah you decide to bring something forth why is it the brides of lucifer so at the time i was working on the brides but in a very different way and it was a body of work that it was in my head, it was ready, it was there. But how do we tie all together and how do we make something unique in the space where I wanted to tell the story of sin and this, the brides of Lucifer and Lucifer himself, where it's a sort of, it's a balance of sexualism, evil, and things that we fear because they are, they look evil, but also they look soft. And they look sensual, but then they also look like they will fuck you up. So it's this crazy balance of darkness and beauty and elegance and evil. Um, so I spoke to them and then they found some old stuff that I'd done. And then like, I'll just grab these and we'll make a collection and put this as a Genesis collection. I'm like, yeah, but there's, these are stuff. This is stuff. This is eye candy. There's no, what's putting it all together. So then I put together the Brides of Lucifer and that was my first collection. And I remember uh, me and my girlfriend were in a hotel because it was, we booked a hotel just for this drop and then we had champagne and stuff. And then I was expecting to be there on the drop and then waiting a few hours, seeing a few sell and that was going to be incredible. And then we're literally there and then we refreshed, half a gone, refreshed again. It was all gone. I'm like, what the fuck happened? Yeah. It was just mad. And then I didn't believe it. It was that first drop was more shocking to me than the relics or the Greg Mike collaboration. Cause the financial thing wasn't even part of it. It was like people's reaction. That's what drives me mad is people's response and just people seeing, uh, appreciating the artwork behind it. Mm-hmm. That's what, that's what I froth about. I will not forget, I was not long in the NFT industry. Well, several months I had been doing the deep dive and been really getting involved. And I remember I had started to do Twitter posts. Yeah. Not, not too long before that at all. And I remember it was, you were dropping in conjunction with Philip Hodas. Yes. 
And I remember putting together a drop thread and I had done, you know, I'd found your LeBron James work. I found your John Wick work. And I was kind of putting the pieces together as to who Bill Ellis was. And that was really my first interaction with, with you yeah. and your work. And I will, I will never forget that. It was during a formative time. It and was it, when it's I, funny that you bring that up because I, like, I really appreciate that. But see the difference, like you were, you put together personal work and client work where now we can just do a thread of just, purely personal we don't even have to put the client stuff in it's true like it's almost it's almost like two different worlds like the client stuff doesn't even really it matters to me as a creative because it is amazing but also as an artist it doesn't really connect it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. visually connects and it matches and it looks the same but from a what's the word from a output perspective mm -hmm. my own personal work is who i am mm -hmm. And giving artists the freedom to show who they really are without constraints of someone else's opinion as a client mm -hmm. is the real magic we're seeing in this place because people are doing whatever the fuck they want to do with yeah. their own artwork. And that's what I just love. So take it then, you have this validating moment, a surprising moment, right? To some yeah. extent, you're sitting there refreshing and you're seeing the yeah. responses that are coming in. Uh, you get back from maybe that you said you were away right you were you were yeah well we were still in edinburgh because of a stupid lockdown but we booked a hotel just so we weren't yeah. in the house for it so yeah. it would feel special and then yeah it came back and then i was literally just instantly like all right well that was fucking cool yeah what do we make next yeah. like what's what's the next and then we did relics of immortal past and i love that collection and I love the tale as well because it's almost a nod to my Greek heritage and to pay respect to where I've come from. But after that one, In Memoriam is what's just, In Memoriam is me because mm -hmm. it's raw, it's real, it's emotional. It's just opening up to everyone. Everything you've seen before, there's like little touches of who I am mm -hmm. as a person. But this one is, it's just open for everyone because like you can ask Alexi, Fred, Malavida, everyone. Like they call me Bacon Daddy as a joke. It's a long time joke, but I've got this persona of like just moody, miserable, quite sharp, sudden dude. But then when they get to know me, they call me a gummy bear. And I think it's I'm showing to the space that there's real emotion behind the art. And I think it's also it's not to judge anyone, but I think real emotion has lacked a bit in the NFT space from my opinion. And I wanted, we've had people have amazing experiences, but I can't remember a piece of art that made us feel something. And I know there's going to be a lot of people that will go into this without taking the time to read and experience the whole collection, which is fine because we live in a very fast paced world. But the people that have experienced it know the truth behind it. And if people have come to me and shared so much personal information about things that are going on in their life, and that was the goal of this collection at the beginning is to connect with people and for people to remember the important people in their life that made them who they are today. I think it's quite important in the space to do things like that, to actually share emotions as well because that's what the art does makes you feel something i can remember very few instances maybe no instances where i sat down and consumed art in exactly that way yeah and j just was moved a lot of art has moved me yeah but this experience was was crafted the the audio interweaving with the visual interweaving with certain text prompts, titling. This, it's Even the mouse is a tour, is a beacon of light in the darkness mm -hmm. of death. So there's a, there's a lot of subtle stuff in there that mm -hmm. if people take the time to experience it, they'll see everything. Mm -hmm. Even just how it was experienced. I remember you, you'd said, you know, headphones. Yeah. Be alone. Right, right. These, these. Just, yeah, just take a moment. Just be by yourself and just... Mm -hmm. It's the same as, I think, what the NFT space lacks a little bit is that gallery experience. You remember when we go to a museum or an art gallery? Mm -hmm. And then when you see the art piece, it's just 
no one else around you matters. It's your interpretation of the art and what that art makes you feel. Mm. And I think it's quite, it's hard in the digital space because it's almost disconnected a bit because it is a screen and we're so used to screens and digital media all the time that, and everything's so quick and so fast. It's like, oh, tweet here, like this, share that, do that. Mm. Where I just wanted everyone to just slow the fuck down, mm. read, listen, and see. And then just remember, you like, just feel your own memories and just remember things that might have been suppressed over the time because of all this nonstop speed and fears and worries. Like, I wanted it to op help people open up the same way I opened up when I was creating it. And there, there's this duality going on, at least for me, when I view the collection. And on one side, I know that each piece is connected in your world. I don't know to who, yeah, but I know it's to somebody. Yeah. And, and you feel that. I feel that. Yeah. And, and I decided I'm not to share who is it connected to because this is not just my piece, it's everyone's piece. And, and that goes to, to exactly the other side. And that's the beauty of not sharing it and allowing the user, the viewer, the, the collector, who, whoever is filling that role to impose who they want on, onto each, each image. And yeah. maybe, some, maybe some don't connect, but some will, you know? Yeah. That was what it was for me. I, I, I thought all of them were beautiful, but there were like three or four that really, you, you make the connection in your own life, you remember the person, the experience is washing over you and yeah. man, it, it hits home. Yeah. It, it hit as well here. It was quite an emotional experience creating it, writing down my thoughts because mm -hmm. writing down thoughts is like journaling is, and loads of people know about mental health, that journaling is very helpful. And mm -hmm. it was almost like a, a sense of catharsis and dealing with like, things that have been pushed down and subdued over the years from loving members loss and all sorts of stuff, things that I'd never dealt with that actually I found the freedom and the space to release. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of this is it's not, this collection is not a sad collection. This collection is a collection of memory of, of gratitude and love. It's not, it's not a eulogy It's seeing life grow from the sadness that's the whole point of this collection yeah that it feels like such a such a tribute you know something that have you shared with uh, anyone anyone who's associated with with these works of art in your own world have you shared with their circles or those who may have shared that relationship have, have you connected those dots and brought forth the artwork and 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 said you know so, so and so in my my world meant this to me, and this is the artwork that I'm I'm using as a tribute. No, I've kept it the same way. I want everyone to experience it. Mm -hmm. That's how I kept it for me. I know who this is in memory of, mm -hmm. but no one else knows around me who is in memory of because I want whoever sees it to see the people in their memory. Mm -hmm. I don't want to skew anyone's perception or share. It's, it might sound generic a bit, but that's the beauty of being able to connect with everyone. Everyone will see something in it. I think the beauty of it is that's your choice as the artist, yeah. you know, to, to share it in that manner yeah. and, and allow other people both in the art community and both in, and, and in your community, in your world as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just to draw their own conclusions. Yeah. I think that's important is, connection and remembering and feeling mm -hmm. that's the, the point of this that's why i create that's why we put so much work on this web experience because mm -hmm. you get to see the collection when it drops but there's some it's not like like this yeah now can you share um how will this be released anything about that uh, I think I'm still waiting a confirmation. I just mm -hmm. know there won't be any open editions. Okay. Oh, wait, this is dropping on Monday, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll be out by then. Uh, it'll be eight drawings, so draws, uh, one 24-hour public auction. Mm -hmm. And then if anyone grabs all nine, 
they get awarded the title piece in memoriam. But every piece is the same value and the same edition besides that one auction piece. I, it didn't feel, I didn't want to do an open edition. Uh, I wanted to add scarcity and I want to make this limited as a collection. Mm -hmm. I think it's just out of respect to what it means as well. I wanted it to be more of a limited sort of drop. I enjoy so much, and maybe this is just me, but the equality of editions, the equality yeah. of pricing as, and those are very cold variables, but as yeah. they relate to the collection. And yeah, I think it would be a disservice to each piece if every piece was priced differently or was a different edition because every piece is the same to me in terms of what it means to me. And then the auction piece is there because it is out of them all it is the first piece I created for this collection. Mm -hmm. And it is my favorite piece, but I also wanted to give the collectors that have been helping me through this time, because there's people that will be able to get most of these. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to give them an incentive and all, and, and a gift that if whoever gets all nine will get one of a kind piece that no one else has access to. And that's the, the most emotive piece out of the whole collection, which is titled in memoriam and it will be revealed. I can't remember what day uh, it's on the website already, but I'll be revealed in a few days. And it's, it's the female figure holding her chest with the heart and roses growing out of her cavity. I think it's such a beautiful depiction of life from death because the bones are there, the scars are there, but all I see is life and beauty. And, and Phil, this might be where we page Eric Young. I don't know what he has in mind, but <laughs> uh, and the backstory there, in case anyone doesn't know, is that Eric uh, did collect Phil Ellis's entire uh, last collection. And uh, from that was I six. I really appreciate that. Six, six, seven, right? Seven total? Uh, no, he got. No, more. More. He got nine, I think. Nine, nine, right. Six, okay. two opens and one all. Six, two, one, right? The two open. Yeah. Yep, six, two, one. So he got nine total and he managed to pull it off. He, pull, he yeah. pulled off the feet. But this is not aimed at anyone because I know Akira is, did similar. Akira did the same with uh, Brides of Lucifer. And Pablo has done something similar as well. But this is not, and I really appreciate all these guys' support, and it means the world to me. It's more of a gift to whoever wants to do it. It's not an open call for a competition. Is if someone connects and wants to do this and have the entire collection, mm -hmm. there's one piece there that only they can have. Mm -hmm. Well, actually two, because there's one auction in the award. And if no one gets all nine, mm -hmm. again, that last piece will still live on the blockchain in memory of this collection and no one will have it, but the memory will still be there. So again, that pays tribute to the whole project. So mm -hmm. either way, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Thank you, by the way. Thank you for, for putting yourself on the line, you know, yeah. going back to a couple, a couple dots along the road. But then now this specific collection, it resonates, uh, like you said, no matter, no matter what happens, no matter whether anyone yeah. does it or doesn't, they're all, they're all there. They'll all be there. They're all be, they will all be that tribute both for yourself and then the others who, who see themselves and their loved ones in them. So and it's almost, I want in the end of this, I want to be remembered for this as well. Yeah. I want everyone to remember, but I also want people to remember this collection for what it stood and for the art not for crazy money or crazy mechanics. I want the true, the, the essence of it and the raw base of it, which is the art. That's what I want people to remember. We haven't even gotten to the drop yet. And I can promise you, I can promise you just where it stands now, experiencing it the way I experienced it, going, going all in, taking the time, which I would encourage anyone to, anybody to do, but taking the time to read, to look, to listen, um, that that's locked up in my world. So, uh, it will, it will be remembered for sure. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Bill Ellis, let's change to a little bit of a lighter hearted note. Yes. You ready to 
play a game? Yeah, let's play. Lightning round. Hot oh, takes, snap reaction, okay. whatever comes to mind. If you yeah. want to hit timeout at a certain point and go on a tangent, you're, there are no rules. There are no okay. real, real rules. But the heart of it is mostly just kind of riff and go. All right, here we go. Topic number one, digital art. Incredible. The future. Topic number two, skulls. Mortality, realism, and humanity. Number three, and this is going to be a tangent. I'm calling it right now. Okay. Because it ties into something we, we alluded to. Yeah. Favorite piece of art that is not your own. And because you have such a diverse collection, maybe the way to approach it is just your last NFT purchase and using it as a bit of a tangent to your overall collection. Okay. So my, oh, so this is part of my foundation collection. Well, I've uh -huh. got two, so I can split it. So if we were to go, let's go with Nifty collection first. Okay. Let me just bring it up. Um, sorry, one minute. While you do that, can I talk about one of them? Go for it. So I saw right from under my fingertips, Bill Ellis snatched the number one of 15 Dawn by Victor Mascara. I remember oh, yeah. that. I remember that yeah. drop well. I remember that moment well. And I remember thinking Bill Ellis has fast fingers. So there's a thing. I mean, it is, it is a bit of an ego thing to get number ones, isn't it? It is. I've got a Greg Mike Smiley number one. I've got a, a Victor Dawn number one. I've got a... Esmakia, where has she gone? Shadow Self, number one. Uh, I've got... And Wholeness, number one. one. I've got a Boss Logic 6363. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, what, I, what I was doing, because I, I couldn't get them in the primary, and then I just saw in the secondary market, and I just saw number ones, and I'm like, why are you selling it? And I was just like, well, it's costing a bit now, but it's just, I think it's pride of ownership and just having number one. I mean, I can't do it with everything and it just feels nice. It's like those are like Victor's work is incredible. And I wanted Dusk actually, and I couldn't get it. And by then I got Dawn and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I love this. And then I love Jam, like out of my entire Nifty collection and my top five Jam Sutton's work is mm -hmm. in my top five. I just love it. I love the neo aesthetic of the sculptural sort of interpretation and it just ties in with what I've been bombarded with growing up. And I love um, Simone Vazani's work. Again, great sculptural work. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously got to love Fred and... Exula Esmakia, Jason Abea's Gaze. I've got a number two edition. I love it. Uh, also, I've, se um, I've seen his new drop and it's fucking insane. <laughs> Shout out to Jason. Yeah, I, I described it as Paradise and Angels had a BDSM rave party. And is if I was to die and go to heaven, I want heaven to look like that, even though I'm not religious. So it's a good description. Love, it's a good yeah. little commercial there. Yeah. <laughs> I love Adam Priester's work. I got wow. a two out of three. It, again, I love it. I love things that feel more sculptural. This piece is the one where the female figure is on her sitting down and her back is exposed and all the cables coming in. And to me, it just felt like an angel, a cyberpunk angel resting her wings. Uh -huh. And I was like, I'm going to have it. This was not secondary. I went all in with mental money. I'm like, I need to have this one. Was um, that a, that was a silent? Yeah, I, I think it was. It cost me seven, 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 <laughs> seven, seven, seven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I love them, and then I love Alexi's work, Euphoria, uh -huh. Mistake, and uh, Vulnerable because the fact they opened up Blake Cuth Catherine's uh, bus because mm -hmm. the wolf is incredible, the female figure is amazing, and it's gold. I had to have it, and. Uh, and you did pick up a Justin Maller, even though way back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's a mate, and you can only show him what he missed out back then by buying his shit. So I love it. I love it. Nah, it Justin is amazing, and 
I love his. That's a, that's a great example of a collection showing emotion. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Justin did it great because it was frustration, anger, and pain, and he just showed it brilliantly. And it's such a like tough time in his life and being locked up in a hotel, mm-hmm. and you just see the piece and you're like, it's just it's blatant. You can feel his anguish. Yeah. So yeah, that's a pride collection, and then that's nifty. But well, now if we go into foundation. There's some funky stuff on foundation. Yeah. I think my favorite piece out of everything is neoclassicism by the art, the art of soul. It's just the gentle resting statue with this crazy iridescent blanket flowing in the wind. Mm-hmm. It's just so serene. So, so gentle and just mesmerizing. That's like on my top love flim flam because it's fun and like, people take history so serious and like ancient Greeks history is quite serious. And if we remember like Dionysius and all the gods were just fucked in the head and all they want to do is party and stuff and seeing an interpretation of this, of just wobbly columns, it's just fun because they did have loads of fun. Yeah. Uh, love the visionary because very sort of goth and Necronomicon, uh, Love the fall of the fallen by random for UK. Cause he's got this sort of silent movie aesthetic. And I mean, it's quite, it's happy and dark because it does look like suicide, but also looks like a fall of fun. So I think it makes you think and consider what it might mean. Um, and then proto skeletoscope. The artist used one of the skull packs in my own store. And I just love, it's this entrancing, like the geometry and symmetry of everything coming together and then just flowing off. I think it's amazing. That, that's like the stuff I like to collect. And I am building, when we buy a house, I'm building a floor to ceiling LED panel screen like the ones you see in stages and festivals and it's going to be in the middle of the studio on the back wall floor to ceiling and i'm going to find a programmer to create some mental display showcase app that can pull all my nifties in create tiles make them full screen mm-hmm. blend them together and that's going to live there and my entire collection from all platforms is going to be there and i can ah. curate it and show off I bet you, and, and I'm excited for it. And I think it is, it has to be around the corner. And if it's not around the corner, it's soon after that. When that is made easier to do, maybe not the floor to ceiling, right? Maybe you have to go to a few, a few extra bells and whistles to make that happen. Yeah. But when those screens become all platforms, mega wallet, yeah. easy interface, much like we interact with our PC or Mac or whatever computer you use, but the ease yeah. of that flying around with your mouse and clicking around, controlling frame rates, controlling audio, all of these things. Yeah. I think it, it just has to be coming. There have to be companies competing over that territory as we speak. There's already a couple because Fred shared one yesterday. I think there's another one called gallery.so. Mm-hmm. It's on beta testing. Uh, there's some there's some cool ones coming up. I think that would really help. That would really help people that don't get it to get it. Mm-hmm. Because as soon as you tell people, oh, like, well, you're on your fucking phone all day. You're on your screen all day. <laughs> yeah. Well, why is it so absurd to the thought of having a screen display of the art? Yeah. And then they just get it. They're like, ah, yeah. Ah. There's like, two yeah. there's two advances. That's one of them. And and by the way, none of this is none of this is necessary. I just think it will take it yeah. to the next level of interest. Yeah. I think that's one of them. I think the other one is whether it's one of the existing ones, but I think it may be more likely a new one, a metaverse yeah. that blows into the picture, has a bit of a that cleaner interaction, the, the, the cleaner interface, the cleaner build mechanism yeah. and, and, and looks insane. Yeah. I just, it just, just making things easy. That's, that's, that's the thing. People like easier stuff. You yes. want to get to it and then one click, not five clicks. Mm-hmm. So that's why, that's why I like all these platforms coming up. I really like foundation because it's just, it's simple. Mm-hmm. You see the artwork. It's, it's closing, you bid on it. You see artwork that hasn't met the bid, you bid on it if you like it. Mm-hmm. And then you go your collection and everything is there. Yeah. You can't rearrange it because I'm a sucker for a grid and arranging stuff. Yeah. 
Uh, but that's I literally when I wake, I wake up and I go to the studio, one tab will be nifty. The other tab will be foundation. I'll be looking at my collection. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would just be proud, uh, browsing to find more art, but then enjoying the ones I actually own. Mm -hmm. and there's this feeling, you know, that you know that you own it. That's the magic is yeah. the artist has said this has value. And then you own that piece that the artist said has value. So like I never felt like browsing on Instagram before anything like it was cool, but now I feel like, well, I own it mm -hmm. and I can enjoy it. And yeah, people can see my collection fine, but they don't own it. Yeah. That's it's right. almost like a switch in your brain that just clicks when you own it. It's like, Hey, you can come over to my house anytime, but it yeah. stays in my house. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, stay, it stays, it's my account. Yeah. You can access it uh, fine, but it's mine. Yeah. yeah, you can go to the Mona Lisa and see her, but you don't own her. Yeah. So I think there's a beauty in that. But yeah, I'm, I can't wait to build this crazy screen. It's going to be can't mad. We, can't wait to see it. I hope you post yeah. it all over the place once you get it all set I think, up. I think PlayStation has something like that as well. But it's, I don't know how we're going to do it. I'm going to have to find a company. But it's, there's, you know, those LED panels that sure. connect together. It will be that, but it will be a custom build inside the wall. So it looks like part of the actual architecture. Yeah. And it'd be like seamless floor to ceiling and then psh, everything there. It's going to be beautiful. Beautiful yeah. day. But also Fred and Victor and Vase are making, have you seen their new studio? New gallery, huh? Yeah. Eight screens as well. And I know Vincent is working on something mad. Well, it's tomorrow I'll show you. Mm -hmm. I'll show everyone tomorrow because it's, it's insane. But uh, the recording right now, they've got a film crew there and stuff. It's, it's a physical space with all kinds of crazy display mm -hmm. systems. Everyone's building. Really fun. It's a crazy, everyone's building. It's such a crazy time right now. It's amazing. All right. Back to the lightning round. Yes. Sorry, yeah. I went off. <laughs> no, no, that was, that was a deliberate tangent. We needed, yeah. to, we needed to have that. We needed to talk yeah, about yeah. it. Number four, Marble Smoke. Yes. Uh, that's going to be a small tangent as well. Greg <laughs> Mike. It was funny because Greg Mike was joining all the clubhouse and I'm like, oh, he, he's fucking cool. I remember him from ages ago from Annie 40, which was a UK small crew that was putting together loads of illustrates and stuff. And they did a book and Greg Mike was in it. And I just saw him, oh, that's cool. Because you can see his work is very fun, but there's also an undertone of some sinister darkness there that not people get to see. And then <clears throat> he was always in clubhouse and never spoke to anyone. I'm like, oh, he, he's, he's proper. He's a cool dude. Yeah. He is a real celeb. I'm like, all right. And then after my second drop, he just messaged me. I'm like, what? And I had like major fanboy moment. And I think it was as well, because the fact he like, he's a traditional medium artist with graffiti and painting. And I'm like, and he said, he's coming to Nifty. I'm like, that's incredible. Uh, and he goes, we should make something together. And it was a real test because very, very different styles. And I wanted to show that I do a bit of fun as well. It's not just, not everything is dark, despair, death, and sinister. Because I am, I like to think I'm a fun dude. Because I do like to share random funny shit. So I just thought, all right, let's do it. And we tried loads of stuff many versions very lighting statues all sorts of things and we came down to the one and it was just me as well i was i wanted to see i didn't it was how do i say it? his drop was so big it was mad cans and opens and animations and all sorts of stuff i was honored to be part of it in that small part that i was in like i would it felt like someone I inspired to just invited me for a drink mm -hmm. and I was part of the cool crew. That's the way I saw it. I'm like, oh, yeah, amazing. It was memorable. It was such a curveball. I remember when it was announced, I thought, Bill Ellis is getting involved with Greg Mike. I yeah. have to go see what this is all about. Yeah. Uh, we, had, we kept it a secret because it wasn't, it was, a, it was his drop and it was just a little cherry on the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it, it definitely was. So it, uh, yeah, I think it, I think it resonated in a really positive way in, in the community at the time. Yeah, I just wanted to show a bit of fun as well and how we can mix the two. Yep. Number five, 
Nifty Gateway. Uh, eternally thankful and grateful for harassing me because I was an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> and if it wasn't for them in Ivy Gallery, I wouldn't be anywhere near here now and I'd be kicking myself and missing out on art history changing. Mm -hmm. Number six, foundation. Uh, I'm addicted. I'm addicted because I love Nifty and I love Super Air and all the other platforms. But there's something about foundation. It just feels like you can be as big as Fred mm -hmm. and Boss Logic and Pac, and you can be as little as someone that has no audience, has nothing, but has the love for the art. And you get that invite from someone. Before anyone asks, I don't have any fucking invites. I get asked 12 times a day. I don't have any. If I had, I would be giving them out to people, but I don't. But it it's, I love the beauty of just everyone is mixing in foundation because no matter what level you're at, it is is the art that tells a story because mm -hmm. there is on foundation, there isn't the crazy trailers and the hypes and all the articles and stuff. It's the artist in mm -hmm. bang. Yeah. And I like that the, the sort of reserves are lower than super air because super air is is great but i think super air is again like high level mm -hmm. and smaller artists can't get in so and then you got rarible and open sea and stuff but i just love foundation because it's almost you know when you wake up and you go on social media feed and then you see some cool stuff oh yeah well i wake up and then every day i'm finding new artists because i'm buying from people that i've never i'm not buying from people that i know Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure every piece I earn in foundation. Yeah. Every single piece I earn in foundation is from people that I didn't know. And the funniest thing is like, there's a guy called Robert Cocker that I own his bubble and he, we live in the same, we're in, both in Edinburgh. Really? Yeah. And he's mates with Eric who did my trailer, but I've never met the guy. I didn't know. And I think I just love finding new artists because they might be in the stage that I was years ago. Mm -hmm. not knowing what the fuck I was doing. And now they know what they're doing and they're buzzing. And then even a small bid as one Ethereum mm -hmm. can change someone's not life, but their outlook in life, yeah. because you might be at the end of just ready to give up. And just the smallest amount will just give you that push to keep going. And that yeah. could be the helping hand. And to be honest, I'm not, I, what, when I bid stuff is not for charity. Mm -hmm. That for me, it's the art. If the art gets me, I'll go for it. Mm -hmm. Like, because I have people hitting me up, like, can you bid on this to bump me? I'm like, well, nah, mate. I'm yeah. not here for that. I want to support artists, but I also want to support good art and design. And that's what I go for. You do it in your way. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with people supporting because they want to, and people being eclectic mm -hmm. in what they collect is. I think is there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure in this space as well. It's because like the big players to give back, and I try to give back in any way that I can. Mm -hmm. And my favorite way of giving back is by collecting from people that are upcoming or that have been in the space for a while, but I haven't had their break yet. And they create good art because good art should be awarded. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that about your foundation, by the way. The fact that you. Yeah didn't know any of them, you're, you're, you're on there, you're loving the site, you're finding things that, that mean yeah. something to you, that resonate with you, that impress you to some degree, and, and yeah, and, and contributing in that manner. And then obviously being very proud of your collection at the end of the day. Yeah, I just, I love it. I show it off all the time. Yeah. And like, uh, example, random, I've got here Deep Sea by Blaze, who does all the marbles. Yeah. Deep Sea just reminds me of going uh, scuba diving with my dad when I was a kid and finding octopus, because it's like, it looks blue like the Greek sea. So there's stuff like that where I just see in the art that just reminds me, it puts a personal connection in me. And I'm like, I need to have this piece. That's the best. But I don't, I, I never really buy out of hype. Mm -hmm. I don't do, uh, it's, that's just not me. Cause I'm not here to flip. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm here to collect art mm -hmm. and I want to have it and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So to me is the connection that I get from a piece and what it tells me. I appreciate that. Number seven, a concept that you have not tackled yet that you eventually want to explore? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, 
I think secret geometry and cultism. Hmm. Interesting. Like cults in general and mathematics. How yes. Because mathematics and geometry are beautiful, but how would that translate into what I do while huh. putting a spin of cult and secrecy? Now I'm curious. Yeah, I don't know how the fuck I want to do it, but if I research and learn, yeah. something might come from it. Yeah. Maybe one day. Yeah. Number we're eight. Rush. We're not in a rush. We've got time. We've got plenty of time. we got plenty of time. That's a good message for everyone. Yeah. In the mania, as fast as it is, as much as it feels like we have to sprint daily to keep up, yeah. there's time. Yeah. No one's taking this away from us. We're good. Yeah. Number eight. Dream collaboration. Within or without the space. You can go anywhere you want to go. Uh, if they were living... Mm -hmm. they're not but alexander mcqueen mm -hmm. uh and living right now daniel larsham okay yeah number nine you you did this a lot already but if something else random pops in your mind now would be a great time to do it what artist or artists just have a little could use a little bill ellis shine in this moment for one reason or another uh i think fenton is a great artist. He's created Cryptomon, an amazing project. I mean, Shine, like, I, I want to give back to the greats, like Vitaly Bulgarov, mm -hmm. like the most incredible CG artist, has worked on Ghost in the Shell, um, Mortal Shell, the video game, Robocop. And there's him especially because it's just incredible. There's a lot of, in general, I want to, like, Shine in the great concept artists that have been sort of neglected because all they do is concept art for video games and stuff. We've got Rafa Grassetti in the space now, which is incredible. And he's doing what he wants to be doing. Yep. Uh, Andres Rios, amazing concept artist. And we've collaborated before on a piece. Great artist. Um, Sick Mick, who I don't think is going to hear this, but he's an incredible Russian artist. We did Necromary together, mm -hmm. probably my most successful personal project and collaboration piece ever. And he's such a he's such an incredible artist and so humble. And living in Russia, life is not easy for a creative. And I feel if he could enter the space, I mean, I'll talk to him, but if you could enter the space and just get out of where he's at, because his work is just incredible. Mm -hmm. I think those guys for now, because they really deserve it. And Vitaly's come to the space now, but I think they really deserve it. And some people in the space might not know the level of caliber that these guys have. Number 10, Bill Ellis, the end of the lightning round. If you can ask one question, to the next artist on origin stories what is that question and you don't know who it is so it's a blind it's it's an artist but you don't know who's coming next if you could go back to the beginning of your career mm -hmm. what would you tell yourself to change so bill ellis if you could go back to the beginning of your career what would you tell yourself to change nothing the reason Boom. why I'm here is because I had that career. Wow. I see what you did. You took me on a little journey there. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that was a setup. No, I just came up with it. Freestyle, mate. But it's, uh, just, it's true because I'm here because of what I've been through. Uh -huh. If I told myself anything different back then, I might not be here at all. It's true. Could be somewhere completely different. Yeah. That was good. I feel like that was your mic drop right there. Oh, it's here. Wait. <laughs> Man, this this was an absolute pleasure. I feel as though um, I feel as though we're on the same page with that. With that, as fast as it's going, no one's taking it away. It yeah. will be here, and because that I believe to be true, we'll be here again. We'll be here yeah. again. I know there'll be a future, whether it's a drop, whether it's just a a release, a collection, an expression, whatever the future holds, wherever the road goes yeah. i feel like there, there will I'm, be another moment personally i'm slowing down a little bit because i've been non-stop since last year 
needs we need to remember to take some time to enjoy life as well mm-hmm. i do want to do some one of the kinds so i don't know what platform yet mm-hmm. i don't have anything ready i don't have anything in mind mm-hmm. uh when i do create something that people will know but i'm just going to let it naturally flow and come i'm not going to put any pressure on it is this third collection means everything to me and i'm happy to just chill a bit after this one mm-hmm. I think I would have said what I wanted to say in the space and it's time for other people to rise up if anyone has not done this yet go soak that collection in for real yeah take the headphone go to the website take, you can go, see it on social media but just go to the website just say it again here say the exact web address nft.bilelis.com but that address exists on every social media platform it's on the description Go there, take your time by yourself, mm-hmm. listen, view, feel, read, and just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. And I think we, Bill Ellis, we will all see you on Drop Night. Uh, congr- forget Drop Night and the hype, and, and we'll all see you there. I know we will. Yeah. But congratulations, not on that, which is coming, but on the creation and, and the birth of such an incredible tribute, honor, special moment, special collection, something that you had to throw three files out because you needed yeah. it just so. And I, I, I believe we all see that. Quite a few tears writing everything and coming up with it, but it was all worth it. And it's, it's really helped as well. Me and some people that I've seen it in earlier stages and now release feelings. I'm not going to say names. They know who they are. And a lot of them have reached out to me and said very kind things about how this has helped them deal with past pain. So Mm -hmm. that's what matters to me. Well, thank you for sharing your origin story. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks for the, for thanks for chatting. Thanks for drinking whiskey with me again. Always. Uh, We'll have to do it again next week. (laughs) (laughs) Until the next time. Yeah. Yeah. It will become a weekly thing now. I need to calm down a bit. That's right. That's right. We'll see you, man. Sweet.